Amen. God is good. Amen. Yes. Well, my name is Chuck Stanford. I'm your guest speaker today here at Church on the Move. If you have any questions about my ministry, there'll be a table out in the foyer. Feel free to take a pamphlet. Uh, I'll inform you a little, about, a little more about who I am as, as we go on throughout the day. Uh, but I tell you what, don't you have an amazing pastor? Wow. Wow. Praise God for those two. Well, those of you that don't know, I am the pastor, uh, <laughs> Pastor Chuck, and we've had a lot of guest speakers recently. Uh, it's been a wonderful time to take a little bit of a break for me, and uh, like I told Ed when he said, hey, who are you? You're a guest speaker today? And I was like, yeah, Ed, I'm trying to cut down to like 48 sermons a year, if you don't mind, <laughs> right? But uh, had a good rest, uh, had some injections in my back, which take a little bit of time. They say it's going to get really, really bad, and you're going to wish you hadn't have done this. And I'm like, awesome. Thank you so much. And they said, and then suddenly it will get better. And about two days ago, it finally kind of settled in, and I feel great. Right? Amen? So, yeah. So i am uh, been very happy about that. Today, or uh, tomorrow will be Memorial Day, so we are observing Memorial Day weekend, and I'm going to go a little bit more into that just before uh, we go into worship, because Memorial Day is one of those days that tends to kind of get overlooked by what our culture has uh, adopted it to be, and I think it's important that we bring it back around full circle to exactly why Memorial Day was established. Uh, so we'll be going into that just here in a little bit. I also wanted to, uh, didn't have a chance to recognize it, because uh, some people have birthdays, anniversaries, and then they kind of keep it, keep it quiet and don't let me know. Uh, one of our own staff, Matt and Naomi uh, Hitchcock, are celebrating their ninth anniversary. Woo! Yeah. So wanted to wish them a happy anniversary. And, uh, you know, I don't usually do this. Or Matt and Naomi, are you up here right now? Or they're probably downstairs getting everything set up. And that's actually perfect. I'd like to encourage everyone, uh, you know, our offering... Uh, buckets are in the back, uh, corner by the doors. We also have a drop-off in the foyer. I'd like to encourage you. They, they are going to get an opportunity to get a little time away, uh, thanks to the grandparents. Uh, praise God for grandparents, right? 
Uh, they're going to get a little bit of time away, and I, I'd like to encourage you if, you, if you feel led to do so, drop a little something in there for them. All you have to do is earmark it that, that it's for them so that they can uh, truly enjoy their time together. They work so, so hard, and they put so much into the church and into raising young children and Matt working at the school, and they are always moving but always so faithful. So if the Lord leads you to do that, uh, please feel free to do so. We'll make sure it, it gets into the right spot. Uh, our announcements will be given by our youth pastor, Jonathan and Hannah. Yeah. Now, I just met them, and I think Pastor Chuck's done an excellent job in choosing them to lead the youth. Yes. Well, good morning, Church on the Move. Good morning. I mean, can we just, can we just take a second and just... Refl like I just want to say thank you guys for being such a cool place that even a guest speaker can feel they can just open up and talk about whatever they want. <laughs> so, <laughs> so thank you, really. No, okay, so today, yeah, kind of in place of announcements, we want to do, or we thought it would be a little fun to kind of honor some of our seniors this morning, because today's graduation. So uh, just real quick. If you're a senior, I don't think there are many, but if you're a senior in high school, <laughs> please stand up. <clears throat> Woo! And that's Kayla, too. So now, uh... All right, so, I'm not sure if you can hear me. Yes. So, um, we have three... Oh, can you hear me? Okay, I'm sorry, I cannot hear myself. So, we would like to send a congratulations to all of the seniors that are graduating today or just this spring, but specifically there are three that have grown up in the church, and that would be Kayla Standifer, Woo! and Izzy Butcher, Yay! And, then, and then I don't think she is here yet, but we also have Jocelyn Carr. Yay! Yeah. So I haven't had just uh, as much of a chance as Hannah, which I think Hannah's going to share a couple of fun things, but uh, I haven't had as much of a chance to really visit with, like, Jocelyn as much. Uh, I've gotten to know Izzy a little bit better because she's dating my brother. Everybody say, ew. Ew. <laughs> but growing up here, being uh, a youth student to Pastor Chuck, I've really gotten to know Kayla over the years, and I mean, I was a kid when I, when <laughs> I remember being a student, like a freshman or eighth grade, being in the Christmas play, when Kayla's just a little toddler running around, laying down, throwing stuff like a toddler would, and that's the Kayla that I remember. So just something I wanted to say is, uh, for me, like my favorite time as a youth pastor is camp. I love camp so much because I get to go spend like a full week with our students and students across the state and just get to enjoy camp. Camp is the best. The worst part about being a youth pastor is graduation <laughs> because the, the students that you've grown to just love over the years, they're moving on to better things. And that doesn't mean they're gone. Like I'm haunting Chuck or Pastor Chuck. I will never <laughs> leave him. But... <laughs> but there is a, that separation. And so as a youth pastor, I'm going to miss you guys. So now, Hannah, if you want to. Aww. I haven't been around here as long as Jonathan has, and these three have been in the church longer than I have been. But I just want to say I've really enjoyed getting to know you guys and coaching volleyball and all of those things. So I'm going to miss you guys, too. Even though there's not quite that history there, I'm going to miss you guys. And congratulations, and I'm proud of you. We're going to cry. Yeah. We're going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> now, so as you guys go for, like go forth, though, just the two of you, <laughs> into the world, this is going to look like an end. High school looks like an end, like when you're graduating, you're moving on, but it's really just the beginning, and you're stepping into just a whole new world. Maybe you can sleep in a little more, <laughs> but sometimes. Give it, give it a couple weeks. You'll see. But uh, remember, you're carrying Christ with you everywhere you go, and it's a big world, but you've got this, and we love you. So we're going to pray real quick for, for you guys, and then you won't have to look at us anymore. So Jesus, thank you so much for just putting these students in our lives. 
God, we thank you for the opportunity that you have placed on us to be a part of, of their lives and to just get to know them and love them. And God, we know that you are with them wherever they go. And Lord, we just pray that they hold on to that forever. And God, that you are truly their foundation. No matter what career path they might choose, no matter the ups, the downs, everything that life throws at them, God, that you are the center of their purpose. Like God, that you are everything to these students. And God, we just pray that that we, we can find joy in the beginnings, and God, and also that we can find joy in these ends. Like, high school is, is over, but God, there's great things to come. And so, Lord, we thank you, we love you, and we just pray for your provision and your guidance over these students' lives. Amen. Amen. So, also, we've prepared a gift for you guys. We'll get that to you this week, and we just, we love you guys so much. Congratulations. <laughs> Hey Amen. It does go so fast. Uh, I remember when Jonathan graduated and was headed out on his own and, and uh, how we had to kind of warn everybody and send out, you know, send out letters and whatnot and a flare up in the sky because Jonathan was something else as a teenager, I tell you what. But uh, it's so amazing to watch them make their choices and watch God work in their lives and, and bring them back around to, to him. And, and allowing the God's will in their life and watching the great things that they will do. Amen. So, so, so excited for, for our graduates this year. And uh, we also had uh, one more that just popped up into my mind, actually, is Isaac Ravinius is graduating in June, uh, I believe, from the, the Job Corps. Is that correct? Montana Youth Challenge. Yeah. So, and he's, uh, he'll be graduating from that and another young man that has grown up uh, in our church. And I can still see him hanging upside down out, out of my apple tree in my yard over here. And he was camoed up so heavy that he could have reached out and touched me and I didn't even see him. So I really feel like he's got a future in the special forces, Chris. Yeah, so, uh, but uh, so many good memories and it just happens so fast, doesn't it? Just happens so fast. I have a message for you today, um, what shall we do? And I was reading a passage of scripture in 2 Kings, and, and uh, Elisha's uh, servant just simply says, what shall we do? And I was like, man, it just hit me like a ton of bricks right there. So uh, this sermon came out fast, and I'm excited to preach it, because if you allow a pastor or a preacher to take too much time off, you're going to get a lot, right? So this is going to be a lot today, but I'm, I'm really excited to, to preach that. But first, before we, we get started with worship, uh, I talked a little bit earlier about Memorial Day and the fact that it kind of gets lumped in and, and we actually, the other night I was watching the news and, and the newscaster didn't mean anything by it, but she just said, you know, as we celebrate Memorial Day this weekend, and it, it, it struck a chord in me that I think we're losing sight of what Memorial Day is. And especially our youth in fully understanding why we are able to have the freedoms that we have is important. So I found a uh, short video that I really feel just kind of sums it up better than I can say it. So uh, if you can dim the front lights just a little bit and play that video. And this, to me, uh, kind of pulls together what Memorial Day is all about.
glorify him, to praise him, to honor him, to thank him. So knowing that we have that freedom today to do so, let's do that. Let's worship him, honor him, and praise him as a group, as a collective family here. And let's put him where he belongs, which is first in our lives, first in our hearts. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. You hid in glory in creation, now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us, so Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater, what could separate us now? Oh, name. 
Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I dream from. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song, cause you are good. Answer all my questions, but you hear me when I speak. You don't keep my heart from breaking, but when it does, you weep with me. You're so close that I can feel you when I've lost the words to pray. seen you I've seen enough to say I know 
that you are good. I know that you are kind. I know that you are so much more than what I leave behind. I know that I am loved. I know that I am safe. Cause even in the fire to live is Christ, to die is gain. I know that you are good. Oh. I don't understand the sorrow, but you're calm within the storm. Sometimes this weight is overwhelming, but I don't carry it alone. Come on. You're still close when I can't feel you. I don't have to be afraid. And though my eyes have never seen you, I've seen enough to say. I know that you are.
until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. In all my life, you have been faithful. In all my life, you have been so, so. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we praise and glorify you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 
Thank you. Something I feel like the Lord really wants you to know today. He says, do you remember those prayers that I answered? Do you remember that situation I delivered you from? Do you remember when I brought the truth out when you were slandered? Do you remember that I showed up in the midst of tears? Do you remember that I showed up and drowned out sadness and replaced it with joy? Do you remember? Do you remember those things that I have done in your life? Know this, I will do them again and again and again. But you must seek me. You must pursue me in a new way like you never have before. You must pursue me. Remember what I have done. Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, we praise and glorify you. We thank you so much for what you're doing in this church, in this community, throughout our nation and our world. Father, we thank you for that sacrifice of your son upon the cross, that we might be saved, that our sins might be forgiven. And Father, I just pray that as we move forward in this service and we hear the word that you are going to give, Father, I just ask that you would quicken in us that you would, you would stir something up within us, Lord God, that, that we would go forth in a way that is mighty, that is unafraid, that is not anxious, but in a way that spreads your love and reaches those who are lost. Father, I pray that we begin to look at your word in a new light. Father, I pray that we are not frightened to blow traditions out of the water. Father, I pray that we are not frightened to know more about your word. Father, I, I pray that we are not frightened to see your spirit move like we've never seen it before. Father, challenge us. Lord God, I pray for everyone here and the families that they represent, Lord. You've chosen us to be here at this time in this season right now at this point in history. And Father, you are working. Your spirit is moving. And Father, I pray that as I deliver this word that you have given me, as always, Father, let it be your words, not mine. Let it be spoken in your tone, not mine. And let us all grow from what we are about to hear. And Father, we love you. We praise you. We honor you. We glorify you. Thank you. Just thank you for being our Savior. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. God, it's so good. I'll tell you one thing. When you take a little bit of a break, it's so nice to come back and worship. Just worship corporately and our worship team, I say it almost every week, they do such a good job. And they work so hard at it. And I'm so thankful for it because it just, it's just good for my soul. When you worship God, when you, when you leave everything else behind, it's just good. It's, it's just good. So this sermon today, what shall we do? Just before I get started with this, we're approaching a month that celebrates fathers. And somebody gave me this book of super dad jokes, <laughs> saving the world one bad joke at a time. It's by critically acclaimed author Jimmy Nero. I don't know who Jimmy is. So I'm just going to pick one out here. We're going to turn to super dad jokes, page 51. Did you hear about the boy who went to mime school? He was never heard from again. 
You are so welcome for that. I'm going to leave this up here, and we'll be going through a dad joke every time before I start my sermon. So if you're going to leave early, I mean, show up for that. But you're welcome to leave afterwards. What shall we do? Well, we know that there are all sorts of problems and issues within our world today, for sure. And one of the questions that I hear on the news all the time is, what are we going to do? Or normally it's, what are they going to do? What are they going to do to fix this? And we've had tragedies within our nation, and we just had one very recently, several of them. And you hear people crying out, what, what are we going to do? God brought it to my attention as I was reading scripture and the news was going on in the background. And we're going to read out of 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 8 through 23 today. But he brought it to my attention that God's people are not responding in the way that he has lined out for us to respond. We're not fighting the battle the way he has said to fight it. So what do we expect but more of the same? We find ourselves trapped in wanting to fight a battle as to, as to how man would do it. Well, who knows that God will always do things better than man. So we're going to read this passage of Scripture. I'm going to share with you what God spoke to me. What shall we do? 2 Kings chapter 6, starting in verse 8. Once when the king of Syria was warring against Israel... He took counsel with his servants, saying, At such and such a place shall be my camp. But the man of God sent word to the king of Israel, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are going down there. And the king of Israel sent to the place about which the man of God told him. Thus he used to warn him, so that he saved himself there more than once or twice. And the mind of the king of Syria was greatly troubled because of this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me who of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. And he said, Go and see where he is, that I may send and seize him. It was told him, Behold, he is in Dothan. So he sent there horses and chariots and a great army, and they came by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? He said, do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Elisha's servant represents most of us. Most of the church today, he's put in a situation that doesn't appear to have a favorable outcome. The odds are stacked against him. And he doesn't seek a way out. He doesn't see a path to victory. There's no way out for him. So he asks a familiar question. What shall we do? It's a question I hear almost every day. What do I do? What do I do about this? How am I going to handle this situation in my life? How am I going to be able to overcome these things? I had some meetings this last week, and this kept coming back and back and back. What am I going to do? How am I going to be able to get through this? It's an important question. We ask, what, what shall I do in the face of declining physical health? What shall I do about my marriage? What shall I do about my financial trouble? What shall I do about my addiction? The questions are born out of the same type of panic that Elisha's servant felt that day. See, because when Elisha's servant saw the horses and chariots and the great army surrounding their city, he was naturally afraid. 
He knew that there was little chance of escaping or surviving an attack. set traps. He's the ultimate hunter. But Satan's not residing on your porch bugging you. Don't blame it on him. Then Elijah prayed and said, Oh Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. It's important to note that Elijah did not pray that God would change anything in the situation. Let me read that again. Elijah did not pray that God would change anything. How many prayers do you hear like that? Our prayers are usually lined up with exactly what we wish to see take place. What we see is our will for the situation. Elijah didn't do that. He didn't pray that he would change anything in the situation. His only request was that his servant could actually see the reality of the situation. Because he knew if Elijah prays that this all be done with and God takes care of that, does his servant grow in any way, shape, or form? No. He needs to see it for himself. He needs to experience it because that's part of where you get growth. You know, when, when I was a kid, when my, father, or my grandfather raised shorthorn cattle, kind of grew up on a little bit of a farm. And he had electric fences. And I had cousins who were cruel. <laughs> and who knows when you're young and you haven't experienced life yet, peeing on an electric fence seems like a perfectly fine thing to do. <laughs> it's not. It hurts. And I told my dad about it, and, and my dad used to call me a knothead quite a bit. I'm like, you knothead. What'd you do that for? My answer was, I didn't know. I hadn't experienced it. But I'll tell you right now, in my walk since then, I have never done that again. <laughs> Not once. That's experience. That's growth. That's a been there, done that type of statement. And what Elisha's saying here is also a been there, done that. Because if we go to 2 Kings chapter 2, 9 through 12, when they had crossed, 
Elijah said to Elisha, ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, you have asked a hard thing. Yet, if you see me as I am being taken from you, it shall not be so. It shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. And as they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up in a whirlwind into heaven. Elijah had already seen this. He knew what the chariots looked like. He was familiar with the fire. He knew the power of what was about to happen. But Elijah did not tell his servant. He didn't discuss with him about his lack of faith. He didn't talk about his spiritual immaturity. He did something that was so profound. He prayed. Imagine that. If you take anything away today, take that phrase, he prayed. See, we're, all, we're always ready for the story to take a turn. We're addicted to our, our Avengers movies. We're addicted to that drama where we know in the end there's going to be a fierce battle and our hero is going to come out on top. Nowhere in any of the movies have I seen Thor and Captain America take a knee and begin to pray. It's always this battle. It's always overcoming evil in a way that God never intended to overcome evil. So Elijah here is not lecturing him. He's praying for him. I've watched people argue over and over again. Well, I think this means that. Well, I think not discussing, arguing. And it's not going to do anybody any good. If you've got a person like that in your life that will not listen and is rubbing you the wrong way, pray for them. If you want results, pray for them. 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. If something is God's will, why doesn't he just do it? Why doesn't he just do it apart from our prayers? Why would he wait to accomplish his will until we pray? Because God has appointed us to work with him. 2 Corinthians 6, 1 says, as workers together with him. God desires relationship. He doesn't desire to be a genie that just grants you your wishes and it's over and it's done with and you've gotten what you want, that is not the God that we serve. The God that we serve says, come alongside me. I want to teach you. I want to grow you. God wants us to work with him. And that means bringing our will and agenda into alignment with his. He wants us to care about the things that he cares about. And he wants us to care about them enough to pray about them. Elisha prayed, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. God answered his prayer. You see, that's a miracle. Elijah did not perform a miracle. God did. Because when a person is blind to spiritual reality, only God has the power to open their eyes. God may do it through the words of someone who speaks, but the work of spiritually opening eyes is spiritual work, and that belongs to God alone. You see, we've gotten wrapped up over the years that somehow if I can just preach a good enough sermon, if I can, if I can just be relatable enough, I can, I can get you to Jesus. That's actually not my job. My job is to listen to what God tells me, and to speak that truth. But the Spirit of God is what will grab you. I have sat through some of the worst sermons I've ever heard and watched massive altar calls. And when I was younger, I used to think, what is that all about? That sermon stunk. And yet, the Spirit of God is flowing, and, and there's so many coming to the altar. 
What's that, what's that all about? It's when the Spirit of God has chosen to move upon his people. He'll do it when and where he chooses. See, we get lined up into, well, I got to pick the right church so that, so that I can experience a God in the right way that I have deemed necessary to fit my little box and my little journey that I'm on here. God will grab a hold of you wherever you are at when he chooses to do so. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. His eyes were open. The servant saw the reality that he could not see before. He saw that they're really mere more with him. Excuse me. He saw that there's really more with him and Elijah than those assembled against them. And this is what I want you to see today. There are more with you than there are assembled against you. I promise. You're going through a valley. You're going through a tough spot in your life and you can't find a way out. You need to get praying. You need to get in contact with God because there's something he wishes you to see that is surrounding you, that is surrounding your situation. The previous lack of perception on the part of Elisha's servant did not make the reality of the spiritual army any less real. If there are 50 people who do not see something, it doesn't invalidate the one who does. You see, faith is not imagining unreal things. It's the grip of real things which cannot be demonstrated to our senses, but we grasp it. People spend a lot of time and energy disputing the existence of God. And some within the church will dispute that God is still performing miracles today. I was discussing this with someone earlier this week. There's this, this sense that has sunk in where the word of God is written, the disciples walk the earth, we're forgiven of our sins, and now it's time to get comfortable and wait for him to return. It's already been written. We can put the Bible asleep. We can just put it away because there's nothing new that's going to come from it. You pick your word of God up. Pick your Bible up. Something new will grab you every single time because it is a living word of God. And God does still perform miracles. You see, but this way of thinking is disputing evidence by non-evidence. Spurgeon put it this way. Four witnesses saw a man commit a murder. He pleaded that he was not guilty and wished to establish his innocence by producing 40 people who did not see him do it. What use would that have been? So if 40 people declare that there is no power of the Holy Spirit moving within his word, then this only proves that 40 people do not know what others do know. Many will dispute the word of God. Many will dispute his power. And oftentimes I, I talk with people who are stuck because they're like, you know, I, I really haven't seen these things myself. And they, and they begin to have doubt. If you're one of those people, you're not talking to God enough. You're like his servant. You're, not, you're, you're playing the role, but you can't see the deliverance. Because if our eyes were open, we would see the angel hosts as an encircling fence of fire. But whether we see them or not doesn't change that they are still there. See, spiritual warfare is something that exists and goes on daily whether you see it or not or whether you choose to participate in it or not. As the worship team comes, 2 Corinthians 10, 3-6 for though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments in every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. And take every thought captive to obey Christ. Being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Paul admits in this that he walks according to the flesh in the sense that we all do. He was a flesh and blood human being. 
and he struggled with the same things the Corinthian Christians struggled with. However, Paul wanted to make it clear that he does not war according to the flesh. Does not war according to the flesh. When Paul fought, his weapons were not material, they were spiritual, and they were suited for spiritual warfare. The carnal weapons Paul refuses were not material weapons such as swords or spears. The weapons he renounced were mere manipulative and deceitful ways that his opponents used. And Paul would not defend his apostolic credentials with carnal weapons that others used. This is where we're at today. The world is encouraging the church to merge in and fight those battles with carnal weapons. And when you begin to do that and you exit the arena of spiritual warfare, you will be depressed. You won't know where to turn. The slightest thing will bump you off course. Your relationship with God will begin to wane and you won't understand how to handle the simplest things that come your way. Our war is not with other people. Our war is with the spirit that works within them. Now listen to this. It's why we need to stop bringing a knife to a gunfight. See, our war is not against the shooter that took innocent lives. It's against the evil spirit that works within them. And when I see tragedies like that, I think to myself, how hard am I fighting in the spiritual realm to keep that from happening? Why is it that evil is allowed to roam about freely to take innocent lives? I don't know the shooter's name. I didn't pay any attention. I don't know him. I don't know his background. But I know the influence that led him to that act. And we have authority over that influence. If we as a body of believers began to truly pray the way God intended us to pray, we could turn those situations on their ear. But instead, it's, it's watch the news and think that's such a horrible thing. That's such a horrible situation. And then we dig our heels in to make sure nobody's going to take our guns. I said this once before and somebody left the church. Hope nobody does that. But we become consumed more with our right to bear arms than our right to bear witness. I own guns. I was a police officer. I support that, the ability to carry, but we shouldn't be concerned with carrying that. We should be carrying the Spirit of God with us. We should be carrying the Spirit of God to a level that if we found ourselves in a position of compromise and there was a shooter that entered a building, we could simply stand up and say, in the name of Jesus, put it down. Put it down. Because it's not the individual we need to persuade, it's the evil influence that we need to crush. And Elisha reminds us, there's more, there's more with us. There's greater that encircles us in spiritual warfare than does with them. We should not be worried about this. But we have to be because we know our connection to the Spirit at this point right now is not strong enough within most people's lives to stand up and say, put it down. The battle is fought in the heavenlies. The battle is fought against darkness. The battle is fought against evil. And there is one way you can begin the attack, and that is to pray and to get yourself squared up with God and say, enough is enough. I'm not going to see this happen anymore. You say, well, I don't live in Texas. Well, God is omnipresent. He is everywhere. Pray. 
and begin to see if God's people will link together, begin to see a shift in the correct direction. It's against the evil spirit that works within those people. That's what we're fighting. So when circumstances close in and you feel like there's no way out, I pray that your eyes will be opened. Because if we will just look up, we will find that there are more of us than are against us. Because God is with you. He wins. He set it upon the cross. It is finished. He rose three days later. Satan's not going to win. He's not going to win, and we should not be satisfied to allow him to have victories just because we know he's going to lose in the end. My challenge to you today is begin to put your relationship with God first and begin to pray in a way that defeats the evil that is at work and begin to tell the enemy, no more of that. It's not going to take place here. No more of it. Put it down. Heavenly Father, I praise and glorify your name. I thank you for these people. I thank you for everything that you've done in this church over the last some, some odd 25 years that I've been involved with it. We've seen amazing things. And we know that you want to use us in a mighty way. So, Father, I pray that our eyes be opened. I pray that we see just exactly what we're truly dealing with. And Father, I pray that everyone here would join me in fighting that battle, fighting that battle for our children, fighting that battle for our neighbors, whether they're aware of it or not. We should be going to war against evil influence. And Father, I pray for anyone here, if you're battling something, you have a, a health condition, you've got something going on in your marriage, you've got whatever that is, whatever problem it is that you have that just seems to be defeating you over and over again, I'd invite you to come pray. I would love to pray with you. Because God says, His Word says, we can stop that right now. We can turn that around right now. There's no need to continue with it. And Father, I just praise and glorify your name. Thank you for our church. Thank you for our community. Thank you for everything that you have given to us, but let us not take it for granted. Let us use it to pursue you in a new way. Father, we give you all the glory and the honor. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind Cause I know there was peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Cause your name is power Your name is healing Your name
Shout Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus, and shout Jesus from the mountains, and Jesus in the streets. Whatever. 
Okay. 